Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where no studios starved over the Thanksgiving holiday weekend. They all got at least a little bit of pie, but nobody feasted either. Not like 2018, where people were positively stuffed at that Thanksgiving feast. Whoo boy, it was Hollywood's, still to this day, their biggest Thanksgiving weekend of all time. Look at these numbers. Whew, talk about salivating. Disney Animation ruled that holiday weekend as they have for many of the past few years, uh, but three other movies all did 40 million plus over the five days. The box office is so much weaker after the pandemic that I had to triple check these numbers because they just look too good to be true. And then I just realized they were pre-pandemic box office numbers. Oh, so sad but Hollywood largely did it to themselves, as we're going to discuss. So, but that's really incredible, especially considering that this holiday weekend, Hunger Games was able to claim the number one spot by just making 40 million for the five days. But Disney Animation, who ruled Thanksgiving, as I said, for many years, they couldn't even manage runner-up, and instead Wish debuted in third place. How many wake-up calls do they need over there? Stop hitting snooze, Bob Iger. Uh, snooze, as in Dave Filoni is an advisor. What the what? All right, so at least last year, they were Disney was taken out by friendly fire. So at least they had that going for him. Kevin Feige was like, oops, and then he ran r- right into a wall. All right, so with the exception of 2020, when they didn't release a movie, uh, an animated movie for Thanksgiving, uh, due to the pandemic, Disney Animation or Pixar has ruled Thanksgiving just since 2015, interestingly enough, uh, when Pixar's The Good Dinosaur was also denied a number one debut by, get this, a Hunger Games movie in its second weekend. Oh, Hollywood history repeating itself. In fact, while Disney animation is most associated with Thanksgiving these days, Hunger Games has its own strong history with the holiday, because with the exception of the first Hunger Games film, which, which was a March release in 2012, Every other Hunger Games movie has taken the top spot for Thanksgiving. So it was surprising because we all forgot about how the Hunger Games has historically performed at the box office. But in fact, Lionsgate was like, whew, (laughs) it still works. And also before Hunger Games was dominating for Thanksgiving, Twilight dominated. So these teen book adaptations, or tween even to some degree, oh, there's money there in the Thanksgiving corridor. Uh, Are there any other young adult books out there? That's what a development executive does. A producer or a studio executive says, wow, look at that. Twilight and the Hunger Games. Go find me a tween book. And then the the studio executive, I mean, then the development executive tries to go and do that. All right, so really, Holly, and also if you're a writer, maybe you want to write a book like that because it could eventually become a franchise that dominates Thanksgiving. Put your business hats on, people. Remember to put your business hats on. So really, Hollywood history is, as I said, yet again repeating itself. And as you can see, the studios have their windows, with both Lionsgate and Disney implementing the release strategies that have historically worked for their franchises. But while the rankings might be similar, both are pulling in just a a fraction of what they have in the past. Ooh, they're limping along. It's not as bad for Hunger Games though, because it cost just $100 million to make that movie, and everybody had written it off last weekend with its lackluster debut. So they're like, woo, it's not dead. And it also looks really good compared to all the other movies in the marketplace. They're like, at least I've not insert other movie here. Like for instance, the Marvels, which opened similarly to the Hunger Games, that never was able to rally. Because uh, for the three-day hunger, that as you recall, Mar- the Marvels had the biggest drop ever. I think not only for a Marvel movie, but also for a blockbuster with like 78%. But Hunger Games in its second weekend fell just 35%. So, whoo, that looks pretty good, especially again standing next to the Marvels. Now, I wouldn't say this puts the franchise and/or Rachel Zegler in a position of strength, but it sure is one heck of a reprieve, as I said. Whoo. Uh, the odds of another Hunger Games movie, I think, just increased. It's the franchise is certainly not no longer on its last legs. You're like, there's still something here. Uh, speaking of being a Hollywood exec. Uh, and then also, while there's the dark, impending cloud of Snow White hanging over Rachel Zegler's career, 
I now could see her definitely being in the next movie if they make another Hunger Games movie. They're like, all right, let's find out what happened to Lucy Gray. And then maybe she could get, I don't think she could get another blockbuster because these are still kind of weak and also Snow White's looking so bad. And it's largely due to her, her, her comments that she made at D23. But I could see maybe somebody picking her up for a smaller film because she does seem to have something of a draw, particularly with a specific like TikTok-y audience. And you know, that might actually be beneficial to her because blockbusters are not working, walking, uh, working out for Rachel Zegler. They require too broad of an appeal uh, and she has, um, I think, narrowed her appeal. Perhaps strengthened it, but it's still smaller. And obviously, all these movies are also hurting from the economy. For the past few weeks, many of you have been saying in the comments, Grace, why don't you mention the economy? People are hurting right now financially, which is definitely true. And going to the movies ain't cheap, especially as we enter the holiday season where money is needed, you know, any extra money will be needed for other things. Uh, on, and on top of that, you know, if you wait just a little bit, you can own these movies on digital at a much more competitive price. And if you wait even a little bit longer than that, well, then you can watch them on streaming, a streaming service at no extra cost for what you're already paying to subscribe. Add to that an overall feeling of lack of quality for most movies post pandemic. Uh, you know, people feel all movies aren't quite what they were used to be. And also streaming continues to step up its game in terms of quality there. Uh, then also moviegoer behavior at the multiplexes at an all-time low post-pandemic and movie theaters, as usual, continue not to be very well maintained. And then on the flip side, during the pandemic, everybody built themselves a real nice home viewing experience. So you have just so many reasons to wait to watch stuff at home. But Disney, though, Disney has a special set of problems that are all their own, which we're going to discuss right now. So the two biggest are, in my opinion, Disney Plus and quality slash political, which I've combined because I feel they're a package deal. As for Disney Plus, yes, it's the Pepsi to Netflix's Coke. So it's, well, it was the second, but now Amazon Prime has the second num biggest number of subscribers, which I find very interesting. Uh, but, you know, Disney Plus is right up there at number three. They have, and they, these three are way above everybody else. Uh, and they're all raising their prices. Uh, but anyway, the point is Disney Plus has a lot of subscribers. And during the pandemic, they train their audience to wait for Disney movies to hit Disney Plus at no extra cost. Much the way Netflix has a very hard time getting any anyone to watch their movies in theaters. Yet another reason to say, hey, Disney, you wanted to be more like Netflix? Careful what you wish for. Uh, Netflix, of course, is a very different business. It's much more specific, whereas Disney has many different verticals. There's just very different companies, so it doesn't work the same for both of them. And audiences are even more inclined to wait when they don't think the product is top tier, uh, which has been a particular problem for Disney. Although audiences waited for Encanto and Elemental and ended up loving those movies. But, you know, I, I think even, I have a question. If you knew you would like Encanto and Elemental as much as you did, would you have seen them in theaters? Or were you just fine waiting to absolutely, you know, just eat them up, num, 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 at home? Uh, as for quality, Disney has become consumed by checking all the right boxes politically and socially, which of course is important. But as I recently said in my Wish review, when you try to check all the boxes for every single project at once, do you really actually check any of those boxes? It becomes so obvious and not organic uh, and diluted, I think. And by focusing again on checking all the boxes, Disney has lost sight of the story itself. The quality of Disney movies and TV has slipped, and even Bob Iger himself had to admit this in the latest quarterly report. Although he didn't admit that it was his idea to make everybody invest so much time and money into Disney+, Plus, which again has been a real problem for the studio. But yet Disney+, Plus is doing so well as a streaming service, I think they feel in the long run it's going to pay off for them. They're almost a victim of that success, because I think they got into a new business, which is hurting their other businesses. It's very interesting. As I said, it's not a Pandora's box, it's a Raiders of the Ark you know, melt your face off box. All right, the Marvels is fun. Wish is fun. But there's no need to see them right away in theaters or maybe even at all. But if you want to watch them, I think they're enjoyable. But if you're angry at Disney, oh, this is a, a particular wrinkle for the studio. Yes, Disney used to make everybody happy, which is why they dominated over the competition at the multiplex on TV, the theme parks, and more. But these days, Disney makes a lot of people angry, and there's a vengeful quality to a lot of the discussion around Disney, with some of you actively supporting the competition, namely 
Universal. And I believe Universal is aware of this and capitalizing on it. They started with their theme parks, which has created the great theme park wars, which we're all enjoying. Uh, and they've also moved into the, they're also moving into the animation to live action adaptation business with How to Train Your Dragon. Although they seem to be kind of moving in the same way that Disney has done that. And I'll be curious to see if Universal can, uh, can do it successfully, whereas, you know, that kind of is tough for Disney. But looky here, what's right behind Wish at the Thanksgiving box office? Why, it's Trolls 3, which is going after a lot of the same audience as Wish. I'm sure that that diluted some of Wish's audience. Because why not see Trolls 3 in theaters? Because so few people have Peacock, right? When they have Disney Plus, and so that's the one you wait for to watch down the line on streaming. I think people have their streaming services, and while churn is a thing, I don't think people are actively picking up new, subs new, um, new services as much as maybe they as Hollywood hopes that they would. Uh, I think churn might be unsubscribing, but how much of it is like, oh, I'm gonna go subscribe to some, yet another service for just a month? I mean, you know you forget to unsubscribe. I mean, that's what they're hoping, right? Uh, so I, I think it's more going paring down and going back to where you were than adding and then coming back to where you were. So I'm curious to what your, what your churn strategy is. But yeah, watch Trolls 3 in theaters, save uh, Wish for Disney+. Plus. And it's funny because so many people do still subscribe to Disney+, Plus, even though they still are angry with it and hate it. But they're like, I'm still going to subscribe to Disney+. Plus. As I said, Wish isn't a bad movie, but it's not a great movie either. And in addition to checking political and social boxes, it added on checking Disney animation boxes as well, as it has tons of Easter eggs to celebrate the studio's 100th anniversary. In fact, as the trades have pointed out, they push that more than the story itself. So, I mean, just to show you how down, far down the line Disney is considering story at this point. They're like, oh, look at all the... Like, when they were thinking of selling points for Wish, story was dead last. Uh, and it kind of plays that way when you watch the movie. I mean, for me, it was Chris Pine and also Disney animation. I just like Disney animation. Uh, I suspect Wish will do well on Disney+. Plus. Not in Kanto well, but I think it could do Elemental well. Perhaps as a babysitting movie? I think it would be a good babysitting movie. But do people still use Disney Plus as a babysitting service? Especially because Disney has become more and more message heavy. And you know, when you become message heavy, it's hard to find a message that everybody's on the same page on. So you kind of, you know, you divide or pare down your audience. And if Disney were to lose the babysitting element of Disney Plus, that would be a really bad thing for them. Because I think that's one of the things that helped them out so much in the beginning. Thank goodness they got Bluey on there. The ultimate babysitting show. But they don't make that. Uh, all right, now let's talk Napoleon, where, whoo, talk about Hollywood history repeating itself. Do you remember Exodus? Oh my gosh, it's the same thing. Or, well, hopefully not for Apple. Because Exodus came out for Christmas 2014, and there was a big debate over the whitewashing of its historical characters, plus the accents that were being used, etc. And, you know, Ridley Scott playing fast and loose with the original, you know, well, that's the Bible, but you know, the story. And Ridley Scott got pretty huffy about that as well. Uh, the debate over Exodus and its failure at the box office is actually what jump-started Hollywood trying to finally accurately cast historical roles in their big movies. But it seems Ridley Scott learned absolutely nothing from the experience. Napoleon has the exact same problems as Exodus did and is being called out once again, with Scott aggressively defensive again. By the way, The Last Duel, another movie from Ridley Scott, actually has the same issues as well. But since it came out during the pandemic, little attention was paid to it. It has the best cinema score of the three, though. Exodus fell 66% in its second weekend, and its total box office numbers are bleak. Does the same fate await Napoleon? Exodus only got to 65 million domestic. And get this, Killers of the Flower Moon has also only gotten to 65 million domestic, which also has ended up having some, you know, being called out. I mean, I, I was the first to call it out, thank you. And uh, I, I believe I was correct on that. And I believe that has hurt the film. Exodus, though, did much better overseas. And Napoleon is also, by the way, overperforming overseas. Uh, also, since Napoleon isn't a Bible pick, it can be, it's able to be trashy and edgy. Plus, it stars Joaquin Phoenix in all his post-Joker glory. It's a big, splashy historical epic, and amazingly, a story Hollywood has not told before. Whew, how'd they find one of those? Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is also, of course, a new story for Hollywood, but it's a very... It's a, it's a very sad story. Uh, you know, it's very dark and depressing, as it should be. That's the, the story is very dark and depressing. But Napoleon, 
Napoleon Ridley Scott's having a lot more fun. Well, that's actually, when you think about it, a pretty dark story, but I think it's far enough removed. And they that's maybe that's one of the reasons they took a com comedic take on it. Because um, I would really describe Napoleon as a wedding cake historical film. You know, wedding cake fa uh, fairy tale movies and musicals uh, have done very well in the past. But I think having that approach to a historical film was a very clever idea. It's also surprisingly inappropriate. If Napoleon had been rated PG-13, would it have done better? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What do you think? I think that as is, it functions as a guilty pleasure, and I think it could do very well overall. Probably doing okay in theaters. I'm curious to see if it has the... Se I'm very curious to see its second weekend drop. Uh, and then what's going to happen on digital uh, and streaming? Because this is, again, a unique situation because it's paid for by Apple TV, and they have their own streaming service, which doesn't function like any of the other streaming services. Will Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon go straight to Apple TV Plus, as all their other movies have, or will they first be available to purchase on digital? Uh, I think considering that both movies cost $200 million to make each, I think it might be nice to recoup some of those expenses. And buying a specific film is an easier sell, I think, than subscribing to yet another streaming service, which, by the way, is just about to raise its price, if it hasn't already, uh, substantially. Even though... When you, you know, here's the thing. If you were to subscribe to Apple TV Plus for one month, and I mean, I think they'll probably release these movies on Apple TV Plus so that you would have to be subscribed for two months, but that would be cheaper than buying both movies uh, or waiting until both were available on Apple TV Plus, and then you could watch them both for less than buying one of them. But I still think that it's tough to get someone to add yet another subscription service to their lineup. And Apple TV is having a very hard time attracting subscribers, even with incredible content. It seems not even a Godzilla series can make people subscribe, because is anyone talking about Monarch? That's a big fat no. Uh, I really love Apple TV. I think their content is incredible. But they continue to trail by far everybody else in terms of subscribers. So I think they should definitely put these movies on digital for purchase. I mean, they have their own, they have iTunes, that's them. Uh, maybe they can make it an iTunes exclusive. Do what they need to do. What would you advise them to do? But I think sending these movies both to Apple TV Plus immediately after, the, after theatrical runs just leaves too much money on the table. And they, they need more money. Is Apple in the streaming business or the movie making business, I guess is the question. But I think, again, with the kind of money they've spent on these films, they're in the movie making business. And they've got a lot to learn from Universal, because Oppenheimer, of course, is the king of this type of movie. But perhaps more accurately, Christopher Nolan is the one who's in a class by himself, even above Marty and Ridley. That's because, I got to say, Christopher Nolan, he wears his business hat. He wear, you know, and I think that, you know, I think also once, a, well, let's agree to disagree on Oppenheimer. But once a movie gets going, you know, it's, it's hard to get off that train. I'm very curious to see how Oppenheimer does during award season. Uh, as for the rest of the Thanksgiving top 10, while the bleeding stopped for the Marvels, it's still unlikely to make it to 100 million domestic. And even if it manages to just get there, there's no way at this rate it will match The Incredible Hulk's 134. So it's going to be the lowest grossing MCU movie ever domestic and probably worldwide as well. Whew. Eli Roth's Thanksgiving horror film had a nice hold thanks to the holiday, you know, being holiday themed. But it's still by far the lowest grossing horror movie of the fall season. Uh, awards films, The Holdovers and Saltburn are both doing okay, although The Holdovers has much better critic and audience scores. Uh, no cinema score for The Holdovers, interestingly enough. Uh, I think that uh, The Holdovers still has very strong awards chances, but I think Saltburns are slipping away quickly. Uh, Next Goal Wins was supposed to be an awards contender, but instead is yet more evidence that Taika Waititi has wandered off, headed towards oblivion, it seems, at this point. I don't know what it's going to take to get him to turn around and get back on track, but it's looking less and less likely the longer it takes. And, and he also seems not to accept it. I wish he would just be like, I had two really bad years. Let's fix it. All right, as, and as Beyonce's concert film is set to open on Friday, Taylor Swift is still in the top 10 after having opened in mid-October and only playing on the weekends. That's amazing. 92.8 million is the number Beyonce needs to match or beat for her opening weekend. Can she do it? She had her premiere uh, over the holiday weekend, just I believe yesterday, which I think muted some of the attention for it on social media. Why have it over the holiday weekend instead of Monday or Tuesday? Uh, by the way, where the heck was Taylor Swift at Beyonce's premiere? That's what I want to know. That is super uncool and surprising for Taylor Swift. She usually is a lot more savvy than that. I just can't believe she didn't show up at the premiere. That's shocking to me.
Uh, but no, and she lucked out that it was over a holiday weekend because no one really saw that notice, but I'm bringing it up. All right. And don't, but don't worry about Beyonce, right? Rumor has it that she's getting a Las Vegas residency at the sphere. People are throwing around $10 million as the number. That's not what Beyonce is going to get paid. That's apparently the cost of the show to produce it or develop it because she's going to get paid way more than that. It's going to be incredible. It will be iconic. I mean, that, I mean, who cares our movie? I mean, I hope the movie doesn't tank because that might hurt her getting the Sphere residency, but all it has to do is do okay. And I think that she'll get the Sphere residency. We'll just, we'll just start a whole new conversation and we'll be the greatest Las Vegas residency of all time. That will be incredible. I mean, that's going to be a great show. She is a perfect match with that new venue. I don't, they just recently said, a friend of mine sent me an article saying that uh, London nixed their own sphere. I mean, part of me is like, good, because we want the Las Vegas sphere to stay more special. But the other part of me is like, is London crazy? The sphere is awesome. And I haven't even been to it. And it's amazing. But my friend has been, and he, uh, he, he did a very good job selling it to me. I was like, that's incredible. All right, over on streaming, we have to skip Nielsen this week because nobody over there wants to work over the holiday weekend. Come on, Nielsen. I mean, you're already a month behind. Someone couldn't have like got the number. I mean, one person couldn't have logged on and put the numbers up. Are you a business or not? Uh, over on Netflix for just last week, uh, so we're looking at their numbers, uh, the, their numbers come out on Tuesday, so they technically didn't have to work over the holiday. Uh, all right, so any, I mean, they could have worked a gotten the numbers out a little earlier on Nielsen. I refuse to believe they, get, they release them as soon as they get them. I think they could have done them a day or two earlier if they needed to. But all right, Netflix's uh, movies chart, The Killer, remains a soft number one for the second week. A couple of you are like, Batman? And I'm like, no, nobody wants to see Michael Fassbender. Uh, and I think that movie is like, it's okay, but uh, I think they could do better. Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't be like against it, but I don't think it would make a ton of money. All right, well, Netflix's first new Christmas movie of the season debuted at number two. That's the power of Brandy. Then with series, despite all the trash talk, The Crown season six, I loved it, part one, Debuted at number one. Not a huge number one, but hey, at least it's still number one. Followed by the Matt Reif comedy special. A gentleman I've never heard of, but if I was a Hollywood executive, speaking of what Hollywood executives do, I'd be Googling him right now. And, I mean, who cares if, I mean, you might be like, aren't you gonna watch the comedy special? I think a lot of Hollywood executives are like, who cares if I personally like it? People do like it. And so I need to be in business with this person. I mean, you should check it out. But the most important thing is who is he? What's he do? How can we use him? Uh, and Netflix continues to think outside the box with the satirical How to Become a Mob Boss, narrated by Peter Dinklage, who's having a little bit of a good run right now. He's also on the Hunger Games movie, debuting at number four. Next week is when we'll get our first glimpse at how Squid Game The Challenge performed over uh, the holiday weekend when it debuted. Uh, again, Netflix's charts just run one week late, and then we'll have to wait a whole month to see how it does against all the other streaming services on Nielsen's charts. But I'm very curious about this show, so I, I've been keeping an eye on it over the weekend, and I do have some, some thoughts on it. I actually ended up not watching it myself because it did not blow up, and I had other stuff to do. The holiday weekend got away from me, a lot of family activities, so I was like, eh, again, if it's not a party, not a big party, I, I decided, you know, not, not worth my time. Uh, but some people are watching it. I saw it trend a little bit on social media. Uh, there has been some press, although some of it negative. I was surprised how many, like, you know, aspiring actors were contestants. I thought that was uh, not the best way to go. I don't know if that was the best choice. Uh, and Netflix, by the way, is already getting sued by some of those contestants. Uh, but it is number one in the USA right now. Uh, when, Net when Netflix releases its charts next week, we'll see how it did globally. But I'm curious if you watched it at all and what you thought of it. By the way, Netflix at the last minute abandoned its weekly release strategy that we questioned last week. Some of you thought it would do very well there. I wasn't sure. Uh, I didn't think the conversation would last for 10 weeks. And I think it, obviously Netflix agreed because they're doing a shortened weekly release strategy. So on Wednesday, they dropped five of the 10 episodes. Then in one week, this coming Wednesday, they'll drop the next four. And then a week after that, the finale will drop and you'll see who wins uh, the whole thing. Uh, but I don't think it quite really worked out. And I do wonder if it's damaged the Squid Game brand, which, you know, although who knows how long it'll take for season two to come around. So I guess why not? Uh, also, I don't really know if Netflix is that worried about brands and stuff like that. Netflix is just really, you know, all about keeping you from churning basically. Uh, then on iTunes, Barbenheimer lives on. Nolan's like, I just can't escape Barbie. Oh, uh, but what do you care, Nolan? I think, 
I still, to this, to, to this day, and I know many of you agree, feel that Barbie helped Oppenheimer significantly because uh, that made it more of a party. Uh, the Hunger Games uh, four pack is still a steal, still on sale. It's just 18 bucks. Dumb Money is now available to rent for $6. Still too expensive. I didn't like that movie. I'd wait till it hits Netflix. That's a Sony movie and it'll hit Netflix in a few weeks. And The Grinch, both versions, is everyone's favorite holiday character. Uh, the live action Jim Carrey version in the top 10 and the recent animated one right, right outside the top 10 at number 11. They're also both on sale, by the way. As for this coming weekend, you know, usually the, the, the weekend after Thanksgiving, nobody releases a movie to give the Thanksgiving uh, releases a little bit of time. Because, you know, the holiday weekend is very busy. People were shopping and cooking and spending time with family. So they want to give them an extra weekend, historically, to go see the films they might have missed while they're still fresh. But Beyonce said, yoink, Beyonce and AMC. Um, and they're like, let's put Beyonce's concert movie there. And so that's going to take all the premium screens away from not just Hunger Games, but Napoleon and Wish, which just opened and we're already stuck sharing them. The, the, the movie times over the weekend were nuts. They were like, do you want to see one of these movies in a premium screen? Well, then you got to go only at specific times. Uh, Napoleon had like the evening showings. Wish only had the morning. And then Hunger Games had like one a day. So I think that also maybe kept some people from going to the theater. I don't know what it's going to take for them to build more premium screens, but they so desperately need them. Like, are they that, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment, but the long-term gains I think would be incredible. And clearly with people wanting to watch more stuff at home, I mean, although some of you, I think it depends where you live. In New York City, the premium screen makes a huge difference, but perhaps, you know, in other areas, your, your regular screens are just fine. Although I find that people are a little better behaved in the premium screenings because, you know, they care about cinema. So that's another reason that I like going to them. And the seats are a little bit more comfortable. So I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious what you think. In New York City, they desperately need more premium screens. Uh, Lionsgate is also opening Silent Night, the return of John Woo. Universal's Violent Night did solid box office last year, uh, so maybe Lionsgate can follow suit with this film. Although, why dilute their own John Wick brand? Violent Night, though, was from 87 North, the production company founded by John Wick co-director David Leach, which does nothing but dilute the John Wick brand, which has always uh, confused me. I'm like, just protect the John Wick brand. Uh, and Japan has their own new Godzilla movie with English subtitles opening Friday, although if you're really excited to see it, there are some early fan screenings this Wednesday. As for digital, rele digital releases on Tuesday, there's Five Nights at Freddy's, Freelance, which remember did surprisingly well, Meg, Meg Ryan's What Happens Later, which I think could do very well on digital and streaming. And then The Holdovers also becomes available on uh, digital. Uh, as for streaming movies, on Thursday, Netflix has both The Bad Guys Holiday Special and Family Switch. While on Friday, Prime Video has Eddie Murphy's Candy Cane Lane. Netflix has another one of their awards contenders made December. And then Dial of Destiny hits Disney Plus finally, as well as the original short film, The Shepherd, which co-stars John Travolta. Uh, that seems to have somewhat of a religious bent to it, so it's interesting to see Disney Plus moving into that space. Uh, finally, with series. Tonight, Baz Luhrmann re-releases Far Away Downs as a series with additional footage that he shot back when he made the movie on Hulu. While on Wednesday, the artful Dodger hits Hulu and Disney Plus. That's the, that's the little kid from Love Actually, by the way. Uh, all grown's up. While Netflix has a true crime docu-series about a celebrated surgeon turned criminal. And people really tend to love those. Thursday has two holiday episodes of Netflix's super popular Virgin River. I don't know who watches it, but people do. And the action comedy obliterated. While over on Max and the Food Network, Warner Brothers Discovery playing with the release strategy a little bit themselves, has Selena Gomez back for the holidays. Then on Friday, Apple TV has the first two episodes of uh, Slow Horses Season 2, while on, uh, finally on Saturday, the second Doctor Who special drops on Disney+. Plus. Uh, they just dropped um, the, the first of the specials, and we're all curious to see how Doctor Who performs on Disney+, Plus. but as of this morning, I didn't see it trending on the service. So uh, I'm curious if it's, doc if it's a Doctor Who problem or a Disney Plus problem. If, did you watch the Doctor Who uh, special? And if so, where did you watch it? And that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And how do you think the Thanksgiving 2023 box office played out? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.